Hi there. Uh, I guess first I should say Happy New Year, because uh, uh, you know Christmas Eve was the last video I did. So uh, we've had a whole like New Year celebration and whatever you do for New Year's going on. So um, Happy New Year, I guess. Uh, I didn't do a video that night because. Honestly, I was just, you know, hanging out with my family. Uh, that wasn't, you know, more important to me than making a video. Sorry. But, uh, I also didn't, didn't, you know, make one, you know, I haven't made one since then. Let's put it that way. Um, mainly, I've been really busy and pretty tired. So actually, like, sleeping at night a couple of times. Um, so I guess yeah, that's good, I suppose. Um, but just a lot going on. You know, New Year, lots of things happening. Uh, first, for one thing, um, we went back to, you know, our normal school schedule. Uh, not just my kids, but... The school I teach at, and so that's been pretty, pretty busy, um, and on top of that, I went back to school a little bit, so I'm, I'm doing some classes uh, myself, uh, so lots of extra busy stuff, and then we have, we have some uh, interesting happenings at the distillery so uh, lots of things going on um, our spring made uh, an appearance um, if you don't know uh, up at Black Bear Distillery we've we've had a, a spring for a long time and usually that means nothing um, it stays underground and we don't have to deal with it however uh, I think two years ago uh, yeah, two, three years ago, um, a small wet spot in the parking lot um, grew to uh, basically our entire parking lot being a mud pit in a matter of like six hours. Um, so we had to have somebody come out and actually, you know, dig and create a collection system and a well so that we can actually pull the spring water out and use it for stuff. Um, but it doesn't always flow like that. Um, it seems that when it gets real, real cold and the ground freezes, that water decides to come up. Um, so that happened a couple years ago. We dealt with it. Um, it's not fun because we're right on the road, so it tends to just stream across the street um, creating a nice little ice slick which uh, we try to do our best to, to deal with um, and to keep from being a problem uh, so just last week it's been really cold if you're in Colorado especially you know Green Mountain Falls Manitou Springs just just so you know what weather we're dealing with um, it's, it was uh, Saturday night when I left the distillery. It was negative 10. Um, and negative 12 between there and, and my house. And I know a bunch of you, you, you guys in different areas are like, but that's, that's not as cold as it gets here. I know. But it gets, it gets cold like that here uh, a little bit less often and we don't have to deal with it as much but the short story is the spring was basically coming up through uh, the floor of our hallway and uh, we had to go out and deal with it and what that means is basically start pumping water elsewhere um, so that it's not coming into the building and creating other problems. So 
I had to deal with that, um, which in turn also seems to have caused an issue with our water main, and now we don't have water, at least for the moment. Um, but and it, it's not getting warmer. Um, let's put it that way. It's not getting warmer at all. Forgive the fly. Um, it's the wrong time of year, but there he is. Um, so that's been going on. It's been a ton of fun and lots of other things that I'm not going to go into at the moment. That they're better left for another day. Uh, so tonight, right now it's 2.10 in the morning. Um, waiting to see what happens weather-wise. Um, but I'm just kind of sitting here uh, hanging out with my thoughts and um, having just a little bit of Jura tenure, um, which is something I keep on hand um, for my my distillery class when we get to the Scotch Day. This is one of my go-tos. Um, I like to keep it around for that class. And this bottle, as you can see, is kind of low. So I'm going to have to replace it. Um, but that's what I'm drinking tonight. So Slangevar. Um, and it's come up a couple of times recently um, in, in conversations. So I wanted to do this video talking about it just a little bit. Um, so as as I just said, I keep stuff um, for my classes. So I have a little advantage when it comes to what I'm about to talk about. Um, I have my own private cabinet here with stuff. And if you can kind of see... There's stuff down on the bottom shelf, too. Um, and there's two cabinets down low uh, that also have stuff. And that white cabinet there has some stuff as well. Um, although, that's not mine. Uh, the white cabinet tends to be where my wife, uh, who is a bartender, keeps her stuff. Um, the stuff that I tend to taste is, is in these cabinets. Um... So I have that here at home, and then at the distillery, um, which is where my distillery operations classroom is at, I have a whole collection of things that I keep for that. On top of that, we have the stuff we produce, and we have uh, some, some things that we keep around that we like. Um, those are kind of lovingly referred to as the, the manager's stash and the founder's stash, but those are kind of off limits. We don't let everybody see those or try them. Um, so I, I have what I would refer to as a collection. Um, now what you'll notice if you look back here, um, only... I think three bottles in this cabinet are unopened. Okay. Um, those three include this one and the two right behind me. Um, those are unopened. They've never been touched before. Um, the reason for that is those are special bottles. Um, this is the Jackson Single Malt. And this is uh, Trojan Spirits and our five-year. I don't drink those. I keep those locked up and closed because they're special. Um, there's very limited amounts of them, so these are the ones that I have, and that's it. Um, so we don't drink those. Those are off-limits in this house. I do have an open single malt right up here behind me, whoops, right there, um, that I do drink, but everything in here, with those exceptions, 
is open. I don't believe in buying a bottle and never opening it. Unless there's some special reason for that, um, like those three I just mentioned. Have I opened bottles of those things and drunk from them? Absolutely. Like I said, I don't buy a bottle that I'm not going to drink. Um, at the distillery, there are you know, things that we purchase for ourselves that go into the classroom or go into um, the, the stashes that we keep around. Those are store-bought. Those are things that we, we can find out in the world, and we bring them, bring them in um, for those uses. So we don't believe in keeping something that we don't open. It just doesn't make sense to us. So what I'm talking about here is collecting whiskey or spirits in general. Um, I find that most of the time when someone says they are a collector of spirits, of whiskey specifically, what they mean is they buy multiples of one bottle, one one spirit, one brand, one iteration, whatever you want to call it. And you look at their shelf and they have six of the exact same thing. Um, or more. Or, you know, maybe one of all of these things, but they don't open them. You can see that in some of the pictures that people post um, and the videos that they do. The bar behind them is full of bottles that are unopened. Whether that means that they have multiples or just one bottle is, is not really a factor. But the fact that they have bottles, multiple bottles in a lot of cases, that haven't been opened and nobody's drinking from them, that's just sad. Okay? That's just sad. Um... And in most cases, those are vanity bottles. They bought certain bottles so they could have them on their shelf just to say they had them on their shelf. All right. These are the, the Pappy Van Winkles and uh, the old Rip Van Winkles and Blanton's and, you know, all these allocated bottles that people go searching for and ridiculously sleep on sidewalks to get. Now, this is all my opinion. Uh, I'm saying how I feel. And if you disagree with me, you're allowed. I don't care. Um, don't hurt me at all. But this has come up in conversations. What do you, what do you think about? It always does. I'm a distiller. It always comes up when you're talking about whiskey. What do you think of allocated bottles? What do you think of, you know, this particular bottle that's like $4,000 at Costco? Um, well, I have a lot of opinions because this is my job, right? I study this stuff and I look at it from the perspective of somebody who loves whiskey. Now, is that $4,000 bottle bottle worth it? I don't know. I don't want to find out. I'm not in the, uh, in the business of dropping $4,000 for a bottle of something without tasting it first. The problem is with bottles that are that expensive, generally you don't get that opportunity, right? Um, unless you know people and have connections to whiskey tastings where things like that are being brought out. Which, if you do, more power to you. That's awesome. Um, I had, I have the advantage of, of doing the job I do, but I also had the advantage of learning from a place that carried a lot of those things. Um, I did a lot of my spirits training in a place that had a pretty massive selection of bourbon specifically and 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 their scotch selection was not 
minuscule by any means, but um, when it came to bourbon and Irish whiskey, the owner was kind of fond of that stuff, so there was a lot of it. Um, and when Pappy Van Winkle, um, 23, was just going back a ways, was $28 a shot. Okay. Some people just went, that's a lot for a shot. And other people just went, it was only $28 a shot? Yeah, it was only $28 a shot. Not even that long ago. Um, I tasted it for free. It was part of a class we were doing, and I got to taste it for free. And I will be honest with you. I'm glad it was free. Not just because of how expensive it is, but because I, at the time, would not have paid $28 a shot for it. I would have been very upset with that price. And here's why. Not that it wasn't good. It was fine. But it wasn't that good. And therefore, right now, I will not spend money on the same bottles for three, four, five, ten times the price that it was then. I, th I find that ridiculous. Um, so, before anybody says, well, that's because he can't afford to taste it. I can. I don't want it. You can have it. Um, in fact, just a couple of years ago, uh, someone offered a bottle of, uh, no, I don't remember what year, it was a Pappy Van Winkle bottle. And I want to say like the 15 year or something, but um, it was a Pappy Van Winkle bottle. It was offered to me for $77. This is like four years ago. And I said, you're, you're going to sell it to me for that cheap? And they said, yeah, because I don't believe in secondary prices. I can live with that. Um, that guy's a friend of mine still. But guess what? I didn't buy it. Because I didn't want it. Looking back, I should have bought it. Not to drink. And not to go on my shelf but to sell to someone else who is willing to pay those secondary prices because, you know, the extra money wouldn't have hurt. But what I'm trying to get across here is having a bunch of bottles that are the same brand, the same product line, even down to the same age, like literally seven bottles of the same thing on your shelf is just wasting it you're wasting it um, and I know I know there's people out there that are like well I buy three bottles and then I drink one and I keep two on the shelf great those are still two bottles that somebody else could have bought and enjoyed that are just sitting on your shelf wasting space okay if you're drinking them very slowly I get it I get it right I get it you have something really good and you make it last I've done it a lot like this bottle right here was a gift from my friend Richard at Art of the Spirits that's his product and it was a gift from him to me and my wife during our vow renewal uh, just a few years ago right so we we only drink that on our anniversary. And it's great. It's, it's a really good whiskey. And guess what? It's not cheap. Um, and you can't get it anymore. So I get it. You, you savor something. I get that. But having unopened bottles is, is not a collection. It's a waste. Yeah. Drink it. 
Enjoy it. Do what is meant to be done with that whiskey. Enjoy it. Because another thing collecting like that does is creates false demand. The reason those prices are through the roof is because people buy them and they don't drink them and they make this demand happen where you know you bought this $200 bottle, you bought three of them. So now the store gets to mark them up because people clearly want them. Then you have the whole allocation system and point systems and all this garbage that liquor stores do and that distributors do to try and get you to think that that bottle is special. And in most cases, that bottle's not that special. They just made you think it was. And then you made other people think it was. And it just keeps on going like that. And eventually, you have bottles of whiskey that literally nobody can enjoy because you can't find them or they're way too expensive. This is a horribly simplified conversation about this problem. But is it real? Oh, yeah. It's real. Um, Is it a good thing? Absolutely not. This situation with bourbon and especially bourbon but it's been talked about to death but my little piece of that discussion is when you do that you create one an expensive hobby two a rich man's hobby and three a massive influx of people trying to get in on that. Some people would say, bourbon is growing, bourbon's getting better. Bourbon is not getting better. It is growing. Unfortunately, that growth isn't for the better, in my opinion. That growth has led to more generic, less interesting, And, quite frankly, uh, boring bourbon. Now, when somebody tells me that they love bourbon, I have a couple of thoughts that go through my head. And one of the main one, the first thought, and I apologize if you're a bourbon lover, and when I met you, I probably had this thought, and you're not in this category, But my first thought is, I don't think you love bourbon. I think you love the taste of campfires. Because so much of it has little character and nothing but barrel. Smoke and char. I don't don't need a bourbon to taste that. I just go to my fire pit and light a fire. And I think that has become the norm. And now, there's a whole, I hate to call it a generation, because that's not really what it is, but there's a whole grouping of quote-unquote bourbon lovers who love the most generic, most boring flavor profiles that strictly stick to smoke and fire and wood. And then a hint of vanilla and caramel here and there. But if your bourbon was made correctly, it should have so much more than that. Uh, That's a whole other video, but this video is about collections. Collections have become the norm. Massive walls full of bourbons that have never been opened, or multiples of one brand, or all of the things that you would you kind of now expect to see in a bourbon collection which are major brands big brands and the least interesting brands in in many cases Um, and now you're starting to see those those people come out and those videos come out that say you know this kind of lesser known brand is way better than this really expensive allocated bottle and I'm, I'm sort of happy to see that But the damage is done. Craft bourbon 
is is having major problems because of it. That's a whole other video as well. Um, my point here is I, I don't care about your wall of bourbon too much. I don't care uh, about your Rolex and your Porsche and your bottle of Willet. That doesn't matter to me. Do you enjoy bourbon? Like, actually enjoy it enough to try new ones? Or smaller ones? That's what I care about. Those are my people right there. Um, if you live in a state that has a bourbon community, a whiskey community, even just a distillery community in general, like Colorado does, that's where you should be searching. Because your thoughts of, oh, they all taste young, what you actually are saying is they actually have other flavors in them besides smoke and wood. They don't taste young. They taste like they're supposed to taste. There's a reason that the bourbon regulations are minimum two years in the barrel. Because that's all you really need to get the flavor profile of bourbon whiskey. Um, now, these are all things that I can talk a lot about, and I could keep going, but it is 2.30 in the morning. Um, and really, I was just coming on here to comment about collections in general. And, you know, your collection doesn't have to be big to be full of good things. I've got a lot of good things behind me on the shelves here. Um, and most of them are not big brands. Most of them are small brands from different states. Colorado, Tennessee, uh, Texas, um, New Mexico, um, and, yeah, a lot of right here in Colorado. Um, so, you know, look for everything. Don't don't stick with big name brands. Don't don't just look for expensive bottles. That's just silly. Um, there are some good prices on good whiskey. That's not allocated and not from a big company. That's my two cents or maybe fifty cents, whatever. Um, that's my opinion. You don't have to agree with me, um, but hey, if you do, uh, even if you don't like this video, subscribe, share, um, come hang out with me, you know, hopefully once a week, um, if I can, but, uh, till next time, try new things, cheers.